Good morning, Church by the Glades. My name is Mario. I am, <laughs> I am one of the pastors here. I am a lay pastor, which means that I'm not on staff. Uh, actually, my profession is the restaurant business. Uh, my family and I own Padrino's Cuban yeah. Restaurants. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Hughes is my uh, number one fan, I think, of Padrino's. Yeah. Uh, it is a, a joy and a privilege to be here. I've been part of CBG for about 20 years, uh, and even though I've led many Bible studies, I've never been here on the big stage, so I'm grateful for uh, Pastor David to give me this opportunity. Uh, before Pastor David became my pastor, he was my friend. I've known Pastor David and Lisa for about 30 years. So uh, he was first my friend, then my pastor. Because I've had the restaurant, I've had the opportunity to have many lunches with Pastor David. <laughs> my friend David. He owes me thousands of dollars of free lunch. <laughs> and, uh, but I got to know him very well, and um, we've become dear friends. Actually, I call him David personally. Not, uh, this is between me and him. Not you guys could use David on him, okay? But uh, he is my friend. And because I know him well, I trust him completely, and I respect him dearly as my pastor. Um, again, we're talking today in a, uh, about the 4th of July, the celebration of America, God and country, one of my favorite topics. I'm going to add family to that. And I'll give you a little bit of my God story. When I was 14 years old, someone said to me, Mario, do you know that if you were the only person alive on this planet, Jesus would still have come down and died on a cross for you? When I heard that, guys, it changed me. You see, I got to church before, and I would see Jesus hanging on a cross, and I knew that he died for the sins of the world, but that seemed kind of distant for me. I mean, I'm just a speck in the world, and it seemed not personal. Um, I knew he did it, but it didn't seem personal. When that person said that to me, it made it very real. And um, when I heard that, I gave my life to him. I said, God Almighty, if you love me that much, I surrender to you. You do whatever you want with me. And I did something that most uh, kids don't do. I asked my parents to send them to a Christian school. I think I'm the only guy who ever asked their parents to do that. And I mean it. If there's someone else out there, please let me know, because I want to meet you, too. So I went to that Christian school, and I took it for seriously. And one of the things I learned there is that the Bible is our guide to life, God's living word. It is instruction. I believe the Bible is the owner's manual on how to do life well. So we had to memorize verses. And of course, when you're in high school, you don't you just cram for the test. So I unfortunately didn't memorize many of them, but there's one that really stuck to me, and it's my life verse. And that uh, we'll have it here on the screen now. It is uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. That has been my guiding verse all my life. I tell people, you don't need to memorize too many verses. Just memorize one and apply it. Here it says that the God who created the universe, the God who knows everything about the universe, is willing to direct my steps. He's willing to give me his direction, to make crooked things straight. But there's a condition. In order for that to happen, I must submit to him. And in order to submit to someone, you must trust them. And here's the thing that happens with a lot of Christians. I think we believe in God, but I'm not so sure how much we trust God. And that is the difference. I tell you dearly, David is my pastor. I respect him, but I trust him because I know him well. And I pray that we get to know our master and our father well because it is easy to trust someone that you know. It is hard to trust someone that you do not know. And let me just say, without trust, there is no peace in any relationship, doesn't matter how many promises are made, but if you don't trust that person, there is no peace. So I urge you to get to know your father well so that you can genuinely trust him. I'll share a little bit of my immigrant story. I come from Cuba. That's why I have Cuban restaurants, even though you could have a Cuban restaurant without being a Cuban, I'm sure. But um, uh, we're a Cuban authentic. My mom's recipes are right, so that's the deal. We came to this country in 1968. It was my mother, my sister, and I. I remember before coming here that I was coming to the land of opportunity. My parents put that in my head. I don't remember exactly when they did that, but I assure you it's in my head. America is the land of opportunity. So as a kid, I came here with that mindset. 
They also said that they came to the United States for us, the children. Never knew what that meant until much later. But we came in 68. My father came four years later. We were fortunate to have family here. So when we came from Cuba, we had family to help us out. Uh, my dad was in the, rest, in the uh, grocery store business in Cuba. So a couple of years after working in factories and all the things that immigrants do, we were able to open up a grocery store with the help of our uh, family. Again, they lent us the money. And um, two years later, we sold it and came down to South Florida. And that's when we started our first restaurant in 1976. My dad was 62 years old when he started the first restaurant. I think there are few countries in the world that allow a man who does not speak the, 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 the local language to start a business that has been the livelihood for three generations. Today, my children are part of the restaurant. We have multiple restaurants. And uh, I think it is a unique place. My parents never complained about what they had lost. They were just grateful for the opportunity to be in America. My parents never demanded anything from America. All they were grateful for the opportunities of America. America does not promise any outcomes. America only gives opportunities. And whoever's willing to take those opportunities will do well. I'll share now the aspect of family. I said to you that family, uh, in, in all our stories, family has been a big part of it. We're, again, when we came from here, they gave us shelter. When we started the business, they helped us with money. When we worked, we, it was my family initially working. So I've had a lot of family support. And I'm realized that a lot of people don't have that type of support, that that's not their, 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 their experience with family. But let me just uh, remind you, there's another set of family that a lot of us are uh, unaware of and that is our spiritual family. Do you know that when you're in Christ, the Bible says that we are brothers and sisters. There are thousands of people who come to this church who are your family, and I bet you hardly know any of them. And here's the challenge about a church that is our size. We come, we, 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 we hear a pastor speak, gave us great uh, information, and not only that, motor, uh, it teaches us about the word. But unless we get to know our family, we, many of us are on our own. We can't do the Christian walk on our own. We can't do life on our own. We need each other. I am here today because of Pastor David, but before he was my pastor, I'm here today because my friend David challenged me to lead a Bible study. I am a different man because I took that one because my pastor, my friend, he wasn't even my pastor then, encouraged me to do that. Um, sometimes we do not have the support of a biological family, but I'm telling you, we have lots of people around us that are willing to be that for us if we get to know them. But we get to know them. And you don't know people, you don't get to really, really know someone unless you're with them. Again, I love David, I trust David because I know him. You know, it's different to just trust someone from a, difference, from a distance than to know them. And we need to get to know each other. So I highly encourage all of you. I really do. My life changed when I became part of a, of a Bible study, a life group. And it's, it's interesting because I remember our pastor at another church reminding us that we should go to a Bible study. I'd never been to one. So I didn't think I was missing anything. Okay, my life was fine. I'm not going to a Bible study. I don't, you know, I don't need to go to it. And then I went to one and I could say without any exaggeration, it altered my life. Um, we have many groups here that you could join. Uh, just go online and check them out. There's a lot of them. I have to plug a couple of them because they're very dear to me because I've been involved with them. And one is the Community Life Group. And the community meets Thursday night. It's a, a, a co-ed life group, uh, ages 25 to 35. Uh, that's been special for me. Uh, there's someone else who leads it there right now, Raul, but it does a wonderful job, and I highly recommend you do that. And right now, I lead a, uh, an immense Bible study. That's why I'm wearing this shirt, because it's called Band of Brothers, okay? So uh, it's an immense Bible study. That is, we meet Thursday night at 7 p.m. here at the lobby and Friday morning at 7 a.m. But um, I tell you, God is good. The summary of this, God is good and faithful if we trust him. If we trust him. The condition is if we trust him. We could only trust him if we know him. We can't just trust him from a distance if you know him. America is awesome. It's the land of opportunity. If you believe that America is the land of opportunity. If you know that it's up to you to do something with the blessing and the opportunity. Family is necessary. 
And even if we don't have biological family, we have our spiritual family. We need each other to grow. So thank you for listening to me, even though you don't have an option to not listen to me, but thank you anyway. <laughs> and right now, I get the opportunity to, to introduce the speaker who, the next speaker actually is the person, a young lady that's, she's a beast of a speaker and also of a leader. She is the one that oversees Best Next Steps and also our life group, Cassidy Noah. All right, Pastor. Thank you. Aww. I paid everyone to cheer for me. <laughs> Hi, guys. My name is Cask. I get the honor and the privilege of being your second speaker of today. But before we begin, I'm going to give you guys three facts about myself. Because I know this. If I continue my message and don't get to clue you guys in on who I am, it will be distracted the whole time wondering, who is this little black girl on stage? <laughs> So I'll give you guys three facts about myself. The first fact is this. I get the wonderful opportunity of being on staff here at Church by the Glades. I'm coming up on my one year as full time on staff here. I do love my job. I get to be our life groups director as well as our best next steps coordinator. And both of those jobs got to do with getting you connected to the church. Life groups, we believe life is way too hard to do alone, so let's do life together. It's not only cliche, but biblical. The second one is best next steps. It's here to serve you as a church. We want to serve you and partner with you on this journey. Like I said, it is hard enough. There is no need to do it alone. Let us serve you as a church and help you figure out your next step. I also have a hand in Rally Nights as well, our young adult ministry. And I would be an idiot not to include this in my message. Listen, Rally Loud is coming up July 29th through 30th. And I don't have much time, but it is a two-day event with four unique experiences plugged in. I can't say that you'll be an idiot if you don't make it. I can't say you won't be smart, though. So I'll say that instead. You won't be smart if you won't be there. So be there at Rally Loud. If you have plans, cancel them. You have new plans. Rally Loud. All right, see you there. The second fact about me is my nickname is Cass with the Sass. Anytime I say that on the stage, I got to make sure to enunciate, because if I'm a letter off, I'm fired. Some of you guys will get that on the way home. <laughs> Cast with the sass. I'm five foot even, but I like to say my personality makes me six foot four. Okay. The third fact about myself, I'm a proud Haitian American. Okay. I am a proud Haitian American. Sapa say to all my zoes, saka fets. I'm a proud Haitian American. My mom came here when she was 17 years old, and she has since then raised four kids on her own. She is also now an American citizen. She is the reason I'm a go-getter. She is the reason I am independent. She is my inspiration. She is also my role model. And it wasn't easy for her to come here at a young age to build a whole new life. But she persevered because she knew she wanted a better life for not only herself, but for her children to come. I think about the struggles my mom encountered. I think about her resilience. I think about all the excuses my mom could have made. Even when she struggled, even when she was raising my sister on her own, even when there was a language barrier, did she not quit? She didn't quit when the going got tough. She didn't quit when she was overwhelmed because she knew this country provided her many more opportunities, so quitting was not an option. She knew a lot of people, even in her own family, had died trying to be in her place. So even when the cards were stacked against her, did she persevere? Even when, even, even when, we're gonna talk about the topic of even when. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, even when. Even when, listen, I, you guys may not know how I like to speak. I like this to be a conversation, all right? It gets lonely on this stage. I'm gonna be honest with you, it gets lonely. So we're gonna have some fun with each other. We're gonna talk a lot in this message. You are gonna help me preach. So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, do not distract me from what God has for me. Turn to the other neighbor and say, neighbor, do not distract me from what this little black girl has for me. I love doing that one because you guys go, girl, girl, girl. Because you guys are so uncomfortable as if the racist police is going to come out and get you. That is my favorite one to do. Okay, so even when, even when, even when, do you guys know that we serve an even when God? We serve an even when God. We're going to pick up in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. You guys are going to read with me. We're going to read this verse a few times in my message because I want it to stick with you. But the first time is right now. It's going to be on the screens. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. See, I think we've gotten confused about who the God we serve is. 
We correlate to God's presence in our life when things are going good, but as soon as things take a turn for the worse, we think God has abandoned us and has left us and has taken a back seat in our lives. Because in our minds, we don't think that God can work in the midst of our brokenness, oppression, and struggles. So we camp out where God has called us to walk through and we give up. But I came here to say this. I, I want to read that verse with you guys one more time. And it says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. He has not left nor abandoned you. He is with you in your storm. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Sometimes our perspective, our, our lens is only fixated on our problem that we lose our focus off of God. I want to ask you guys a question. I want you guys to be honest with me, but answer in your heads. Do you truly believe what the Bible says? Yeah. I said in your heads, guys. <laughs> Do you truly believe what the Bible says? Do you have faith in God's word? Do you believe that every promise in the Bible is, is true, that it reigns not only from the Bible then, but for your life now? Do you have faith in God's word? Because I'll be real, I see a lot of Christians walk in the middle of their struggle, in the middle of their storm with such little confidence. It's not like you don't believe in God anymore or his miracles. It's just that you don't believe it for yourself. That you don't believe that God can work in your life. That yes, you've seen God work in their life, but there's no way he can work in yours. As if every single pr promise and verse in this Bible is written for everybody else in this room except for you. Because it is so easy to read these verses in the Bible and walk away and go, mm, that's good. But walk right away. Because let's be real, faith is risky. But it wouldn't be faith without any doubts. I want to break down this verse with you guys. There are two main promises I want to focus on. I already shared one promise, that is that he'll be with you. But there are two promises, another, another two that I want to focus on. And the first one is this, you'll go through it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you'll go through it. The second promise is you'll get through it. Oh, I didn't even say it, guys. Turn to your neighbor and say, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. We're going to read this verse two more times. The first time the word when is going to be highlighted. And you're going to scream at the top of your lungs when you see it. The second time another word will be highlighted. But I'll let you in what that word is when we get there. So, ready? It's going to be on the screens. So I'm going to clue you in. Ready? One, two, three. When? Good job. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When? You go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When? You walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Win, 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 never if. Never does it say if. I don't know why in our brains we think that as soon as we become Christians, we no longer will face any oppression or opposition. It is never written here in that Bible at all. It promises win. Turn to your neighbor, say neighbor. You'll go through it. Turn to your other neighbor, say neighbor. You're going through it. Someone's actually going through it and is like, yeah, I am. <laughs> you'll go through it. You'll go through it. But the second promise makes it so much worth it that you'll get through it. The second time, we're going to read the word through. We're going to read the word through. It's going to be on the screens. You're going to read it as loud as you can. When you go through. deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through. rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through. the fire of oppression, will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Through. Through means I'll see the other side of it. This is not where you live. This is not where you camp out. This is not your home. You'll see the other side of it, through. So many of us have used what we're going through to be the perspective of which we view everything. We let our situations become the excuse for our actions. I wanna tell you something today and I, wanna, I want you to take this with you. Stop letting what you're going through define who you are. So, the reason I did this whole message today is because I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to keep going. This country is built on years of sacrifices and battles fought. But suddenly in this generation, we believe if we don't get instant gratification, God's presence is off of our life and we give up. Keep going. Keep going. And listen, I know this. It is going to feel like you are going to drown. You are going to feel overwhelmed. You are going to feel consumed. You're going to feel like you are being burned up. But how many of us know that feeling is not fact? Just because you feel like it does not make it is. These promises are written for you. You will get through it. 
This is not your home. Your home is victory and it's only yours if you keep going. Do not camp out where God has called you to walk through. But the best part about all of this, you do not have to believe me. You do not have to believe me. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I dare you. No, I need you to say, I dare you. I triple dog dare you. To walk with this confidence in the middle of your storm and watch how God shows out in your life. I get the wonderful opportunity to get to introduce our third speaker. He's our worship pastor. He's a ball of sunshine and fun. Lucas Gomez. Come on, give it up for Cassidy and Pastor Mario. I think Cassidy just called me a ball of sunshine, which I'm gonna take it as a compliment. It's a compliment, right? Okay, I don't know. It just felt, I don't know. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, my name's Lucas. I am um, the worship pastor on staff here. Man, I'm, I'm excited to be here. It's a huge honor to stand on the stage, hold a microphone, and talk to you guys. I, uh, as Pastor David mentioned, everybody speaking is either an immigrant or first generation in this country. And man, my parents are from Brazil. Most of my family still lives there. Yeah, I think we got some Brazilians at church by the glades. Come on. And uh, I love Brazil. I have amazing memories as a kid, uh, hanging out with my cousins, my aunts, my uncles. I really, really, really do love Brazil. It has a special place in my heart. But I also have vivid memories of seeing the environment that my parents grew up in. And I have vivid memories as a kid, man, reminded over and over and over why they came to this country. So I love Brazil, but I gotta say, this 4th of July weekend, I'm grateful to be in the United States of America. From the bottom of my heart, I really am. And so, my parents came to this country, they didn't want us to stop speaking Portuguese. So we only spoke Portuguese at home. My parents didn't want us to lose, you know, connection with that part of ourselves, with culture. And so one of the ways they did that is we always had Brazilian friends. We always had Brazilian community by going to Brazilian church. So as a kid, I got double church a lot, all right? We did church in English, church in Portuguese. And there was no shortage of Brazilian churches in South Florida. A lot of Brazilians around here. Maybe you've been to Little Brazil in Sunrise, or you might call it the Sawgrass Mall. Okay. <laughs> a lot of Brazilians. A lot of Brazilians. And you, you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> um, going to Brazilian church, as a kid going to church, you learn songs. Music is a really effective way to teach somebody something. Just the repetition of song is a great way to learn truth. And as a kid growing, going to Sunday school, if you know the song, don't leave me hanging. We sang this song as a kid in Sunday school. This little light of mine. Okay, you guys know that one. You will not know this next one. So we would do that, and then we go to Brazilian church, and we sing the songs in Portuguese, right? And so I got some of these songs stuck in my head all these years later. And there's one song I sang as a kid. It's about a story in Luke chapter 17. I'm going to sing it for you now, all right? I'm going to sing it, and I'm going to translate it. It went like this. Dez homens Jesus curou. Dez homens Jesus curou. Nove foi embora, mais um ficou. That's the song. It's not that good. Don't clap. It's just, it's just stuck in my head. Okay. The, the lyrics are, 10 men that Jesus healed, 10 men that Jesus healed, nine went away, but one came back. All right. It's a story about Jesus healing these 10 lepers. Nine of them leave, but only one stops to say thank you. And so I sang this song as a kid and people would laugh at me. And the more they laughed, the more I sang it. And, and you know, the more I sang it, the more they laughed. And my mom came to me and she was like, Lucas, stop singing that song. And I was like, people love it. Why would I do that? And she told me, you're, you're saying some of these words wrong. And I, I have a three-year-old son and little kids can't really enunciate all the time, right? So my son wants pischetti instead of spaghetti. And I don't correct them because it's cute. But I'm saying something. I, I, I wasn't saying what I thought I was saying, singing this song. Okay. So instead of singing, Dez homem Jesus curo, I was singing, Dez homem Jesus furo. Days and, and I'm like, what, what, what's the big deal? And so, okay, it's, it's bad. Instead of singing, 10 men that Jesus healed, I was singing, 10 men that Jesus stabbed, 10 men that Jesus stabbed. Nine went away, but one came back. Okay, so it even rhymes when, I, when you say stab and back, but I am here to clear the air once and for all. Jesus did not, in fact, stab these 10 men, okay? He healed them. I'm going to prove it to you right now. It's in the Bible. I promise you didn't stab him. Luke 17, 11 through 19. Would you read this story with me? I can't read the story without thinking about that song, so I figured I'd share that with you guys. Okay. The Bible says this. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. 
and as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give God praise or to give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus is on the move and he encounters these 10 lepers. If you have not read the Bible much, leprosy is a disease that comes up a lot. Leprosy was a super contagious disease, very deadly. And they live in a place with unsanitary living conditions, not much running water. If you get leprosy, you're done. You're ostracized from society. You can't come near anybody. So these guys had leprosy. They had a death sentence. They were told you got to stay away. If you came towards somebody with leprosy, they had to identify themselves. Unclean, like don't come anywhere near me. So these guys were complete outcasts. Nobody could come near them. So it's not a surprise that all 10 of them were hanging out together because no one else can come near them, right? If, they, if no one else come near them, they all have leprosy. So they all got together. The 10 of them see Jesus and they say, Jesus, master, have pity on us. Let's look at Jesus' response together in verse 14. I've highlighted three words. Would you read these words with me? It says, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. So Jesus gave them specific instructions. He said, go show yourself to the priest. So the priest would have been the authority who determines if you're clean or unclean. These guys undoubtedly have already shown themselves to the priests. And the priest already told them, you're unclean. You can't be here anymore. And so a logical response might be, you know, Jesus, we already did that. You sure? Like, this doesn't seem like the most logical thing. But they didn't do that. They didn't question. They heard what Jesus said. They obeyed. And then the Bible says that as they went, they were cleansed. I've talked to people before who have said some version of this. They've said, man, if God would bless me with more, then I could be generous. If God would bless me with a spouse or children, then I could be happy. If God would heal me, then I could finally serve him in the way that I want to. I'm here to tell you today that the blessing in your life that you've been praying for, hoping for, waiting for, man, if it's going to come, it's going to come as you go. As you go and do what Jesus has already told you to do. Can I ask you a question about these 10 lepers? How much faith do you think they had? The answer is, I have no idea, okay? <laughs> Maybe you're like, oh, is he going to tell us? I don't know. There was 10 of them, so it probably varied, right? Maybe one of them had a lot of faith. Maybe one of them was like, oh, I've heard of this Jesus guy, man. He can really heal people. Maybe one of them had a ton of doubts. Like, I'm not so sure this Jesus guy can actually do anything for us. I don't know how much faith each leper had, but I do know that all of them acted on whatever little bit of faith they did have. They all obeyed, and that's when the blessing showed up in their life. Let me give you two quick verses to help you get this. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then James 2.17 says, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is useless. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, but faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is useless. How do you know the faith is authentic? When it's partnered with some type of step in obedience. When did the blessing come for these lepers? The blessing was in the obedience. The blessing is in the obedience. That's the first thing that I want you to take away from this story. The blessing was in the obedience. When you start walking in the way that God has called you to walk, that's when the blessing starts to show up in your life. The blessing is in the obedience. Just a few more verses. Can we read them together? 14 through 19. It's on the screen right now. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. How many of the lepers do you think were grateful that they were healed? All 10, no doubt. How many gave thanks? Just one. There's a difference between gratitude and thanksgiving. Gratitude is something that you feel. Thanksgiving is something that you do. And so if I ask everybody here, are you grateful? I think a lot of people would say yes. If I ask you, are you grateful for your spouse, for your children, for your parents, for your siblings? Are you grateful for your job? You grateful for this church? You grateful for the place that you live? Are you grateful you have a car that turns on on the first try? 
I don't know if you ever had a car that doesn't start on the first try. That's terrible, okay? Are you grateful? Are you grateful for the people that you love? When was the last time you told them? You see the difference between gratitude and thanksgiving? I know you feel grateful, but there's a difference between feeling grateful and giving thanks. And the gratitude that all nine of those other lepers felt didn't really get the attention of Jesus, but the one who gave thanks, Jesus, Jesus, that man got Jesus' attention. And so if there's something we could take away from the story, it would be don't just feel grateful, but give thanks. Because when Jesus asked, man, where are the nine? Where are the 90% of people who experience my goodness? Where are the 90% of people who experience my grace? Where are the 90%? I don't want to be one of the nine. I want to be one of the 10% of people who actually, I want Church by the Glades to be the one who shows up and doesn't take for granted what God does in their life. And last thing I want us to take away from this story is who set the example for them all? Man, you may notice the Bible specifies a Samaritan and then Jesus says, it's just this foreigner. Racism, discrimination, bigotry is not a new problem at all. It's a problem that's existed since the beginning of time. And the Samaritans in this society, man, they would have been the lowest of the low. The Jews hated these people. I mean, they would travel days out of their way on foot just so they didn't have to walk through Samaria. And then Jesus points it out why. Jesus says, the one who set an example for all of you was the one who you thought was the lowest. The person who you all should be learning from is the person who you disregarded and thought was less than. Because Jesus doesn't care what you look like, what language you speak, where you're from. Jesus does not care what society says about a group of people. In 1 Samuel, the Bible says that God doesn't see the way man sees. Man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so one thing we can all strive to do to be more like Jesus is not judge people based on their appearance, but to look to the heart the way that God does. And so this 4th of July weekend, man, we're celebrating America. And I told you earlier, I love this country. There's a lot of patriotism on this stage today. But the ideals that America was founded on, freedom. America did not invent freedom. God invented freedom. We don't worship America at Church by the Glades. We worship God. But one of the ways that we can worship God and honor God is not just by feeling grateful for America, but by giving thanks for the opportunity that God has given us to live in this country.